Uh, thank you very much for introducing me. Hello, everyone. My name is Alina. I'm a software engineer at TIOP in London. I do infrastructure security. For those of you who don't know about TIOP, um, it is a website and mobile app that connects people with great local businesses. Um, Yop is also in Spain, uh, luckily, and uh, yeah, so anything from you can find from restaurants, bars, and spas to dog groomers, mechanics, and even dentists. So not only food-related places. And uh, if you're new to Yelp or you haven't already done so, um, you might want to check out the app for some great reviews nearby. And uh, Barcelona is a really great place for very good food. Cool. Um, this is the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about shifting security to the left and uh, introducing it as early as possible into the development um, process. Um, then I will talk about how our CI CD, so continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, pipelines look like, um, what kind of security tests uh, we have in place at this level, and um, how we do um, alert for failures and how we track them and uh, and fix them, of course. Uh, and uh, we should also have some time for questions um, at the end. Yeah, I want to. Uh, spend a little bit of time talking about yeah this shift to the left paradigm which is one of the reasons we've put in place all those tests that I'm going to go through uh, very soon. Um, security should, should be actually everyone's responsibility not only security um, security team's responsibility um, from when the code is uh, designed uh, developed and tested until it's um, deploy to production and after that. So the aim is to have it as early as possible into the development life cycle and at all stages by having a more proactive approach rather than only reacting when something bad happens. Automation is basically key for all of this because we have like thousands of services and it will not scale. Um, and uh, this should also uh, increase the collaboration between teams, so we'll not have silos between the development and operation and the security teams. And uh, the latter will be able to assist, fix any security issues throughout the process, rather than uh, being a blocker against um, going to production because it was involved too late into the process. And, this is what happens in the picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's from from Twitter. Um, I quoted the author, but I think it's not visible. It's like when it's in gray on the left corner, so it was, it's not mine. Uh, and last but not least, uh, it's a lot cheaper to find security problems uh, during the internal development rather than when the service or the code is already in production and the company's money and reputation uh, could be affected in case of a breach. We do have thousands of services at Yelp. They run in Docker, obviously. Um, they run on our platform as a service that we built in-house. It's called Pasta. It has been uh, around for a while. You can find it on our public GitHub. And uh, if you're curious about the technologies um, behind it, we use Docker for containers, uh, Mesos for scheduling work. Uh, maybe, oh cool. Yeah, Mesos, uh, Marathon. This is the Mesosphere logo, I think. Uh, Smart Stack from Airbnb. It's an um, open, uh, open source project of them for um, service registration and discovery. Uh, then Sensu, Sensu, for monitoring and alerting. I will come back to it at the end. Uh, and of course, uh, Jenkins, where the CI CD pipelines are run. This is how a simple pipeline looks like. So from a configuration repository, um, we, Jenkins orchestrates the build and the deployment of our, ser our, of our services. Um, and uh, particularly, we use pipelines of sequential steps that watch for pushes to Git repositories, then they build the application artifacts, 
um, ran different tests, including some performance tests, and uh, rolled the code through different development and stage environments before pushing the application to production to be run on, on pasta, which I've just uh, mentioned. And uh, one step in this pipeline is the security check step, the, the one in the middle um, that I'm going to uh, discuss in detail uh, next. It consists of a set of tests. Um, they are written in Python. Um, that very high level, they check the security status of the service. Um, and it's quite handy to find out with every build uh, how a service is doing security-wise. So whenever anything changes or there's anything different, uh, the owner team gets an alert and they can immediately have a look um, to fix any any problems. So we find this is quite helpful. If you remember this diagram from a few slides ago, um, the past the security check is basically at the build level. Okay, should be big enough. Now, if you want to go even more to the left, we can do so at the design level by um, adding a security section into the design document template if we, or like a privacy consideration if we already uh, have that, like to ask for se the security aspect of the new code. Um, or at the development uh, phase um, with secure by default libraries, um, pre-commit hooks um, that do different like static analysis, or of course in, in code reviews with our peers. And uh, yeah, even after everything is deployed with um, pen tests, uh, we can run back bounty programs, um, put in place different like scanners or do even more. Um, static analysis. I'm now going to walk through the six, seven security tests that I run every time, the, every time, every service uh, is built. Um, and uh, what you will see on the very bottom is the output from Jenkins, basically what engineers can see, everyone can see who has access to Jenkins. Um, first of all, we check if the latest Debian packages are installed against um, upstream uh, repositories. So to do that, we pull the Docker image of the service, uh, run the container, and inside the container, we do an apt-get update followed by an apt-get dist upgrade um, to see uh, if any new packages are available. Minus QK is super quiet, so we don't want the output to be too verbose. Um, and uh, minus minus just print is a kind of a dry run mode, so no changes will actually be performed. Um, we want to, to see the output and decide what to do. Um, yeah, because this upgrade is quite aggressive, so not only updates uh, existing packages, but could also try to like remove um, packages which are not uh, needed anymore or uh, install new ones to um, to cope with like dependency, so we want to to vet that. And uh, for every new version which is found, it will write to the console the current version and the version we should upgrade to. Um, similar you could what you can see. So package system D needs to be updated from something dot four to something dot five. Alright. Um, then we want to check back, uh, Docker best practices. And, um, first of all, we want the container, um, to not run as user root because that's not the least privilege. Uh, it's not following the principle of least privilege. And, uh, unfortunately, by default, this is, uh, this is a default behavior. So if you don't have a user statement into the Docker file, the container will run as user root. Obviously, very bad. Um, now, I remember a tweet from AWS reInvent conference, you know, that big Amazon conference in Las Vegas from last year, which was saying that 86% of the images, the public images from Docker Hub, they don't have a user statement. So that is a lot and such an easy thing to do. Moreover, we want the service to use Docker images that we maintain, so we do know what they do contain. 
and uh, of course latest images that we don't want uh, older versions. Related to the previous test, people could pin Debian packages um, into the Docker file behavior that we want to discourage by failing the latest packages check and uh, mentioning about the pinning into the uh, the Jenkins log. And uh, the last one is very interesting. It looks like a minor thing. Dot .git should be added to dot .docker ignore. By doing so, we make sure that dot .git will not end up into the final Docker image of the service, which basically translates into don't store information about your Git repository in production. Um, because even though your web server doesn't have directory listing enabled, um, a diligent attacker will still be able to download the entire code and look for more severe issues. So we should pay attention to like small details like this. In terms of well-known vulnerabilities, one very specific that we are looking for is um, shell shock. It's a bash vulnerability. It's also super easy to check under 15 lines of code. Um, so it's a really nice quick win. Um, the vulnerability uh, is about being able to uh, unintentionally run um, arbitrary commands from environment variables. And um, if the attack is successful, the uh, yeah the attacker uh, sorry if the exploit is successful, the attacker could be uh, is able to take over the machine remotely and have full control. So not not good at all. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to extend the list uh, in the future and look for other common vulnerabilities like um, similar to this one. And then uh, we do code dependency check for a few code bases, um, but the idea is very similar. So for example, for Node, um, there is npmjs.com slash advisories which is a database of vulnerable packages, the vulnerability they suffer from, and the version we should uh, we should use instead if it was patched. So not all of them are patched. And uh, what we do, we parse the yarn.log file, um, which contains all the packages with all the versions that the application is using. And for every package, we check if there is on the database of vulnerabilities. And uh, for Python, in a very similar way, we parse the requirements.txt file, uh, which again contains the packages and the versions used, uh, and um, check against the database of, of vulnerabilities. There's also a project called Safety, which does everything for you, so you don't have to parse anything, you don't have to check. Um, yeah, basically does everything for you. Um, and the database is updated every month for the free version and in real time, a lot more convenient, of course, for the paid version. Image vulnerability scanning and the next one, we, we currently do standalone and I will explain a second why. Um, that's very honest. Um, they are not part of the security tests run by Jenkins but um, they are very great candidates to be integrated. Um, so what we do, we scan our base Docker images with Claire from CoreOS, it's um, open source as well, and um, the scan provides a list of high, medium, low, and negligible common vulnerabilities and exposures, or CVEs, uh, which were found on which packages and the version we should upgrade to uh, in order to get a patch. And uh, the reason this is not part of the Jenkins pipeline is because it takes um, quite a few minutes, like five to 10 minutes um, to run and uh, we don't want to block the pipeline um, for so long. That's a long time for like a developer to like uh, wait 10 minutes. Maybe there are some other stuff running in the pipeline. Um, yeah, to wait such a long time to see the result. Um, if there's one thing you will remember from this presentation, uh, it's probably this one. Um, if you're not scanning base Docker images, um, you should start doing so. And uh, when you decide to upgrade packages, um, don't patch running containers. Um, so don't SSH into the container and do the upgrade manually, because not only it will not scale, but next time you'll spin up a new container, uh, the old 
uh, the image will still have the old version, so we didn't solve actually the problem. Um, so rebuild the base image with the latest or like a desired version. And uh, lastly, we want to detect and prevent high entropy strings from entering uh, the code base, the code bases, um, by assuming the existing code has no secrets and only checking uh, the the new code. And uh, to do so, we wrote our own um, Python code, which is called detect secret. It's on our GitHub as well. It's loosely based on Trufflehog, which is a secret scanner from GitHub, open source too. And uh, right now what we do for a service, we try to detect if any secrets are about to be pushed to the repositories as a pre-commit hook. So, um, but doing so when the service is built, so I think actually this is even easier to integrate. Um, doing so when the service is built as part of the security check step is a good way to double check that the developers didn't try to bypass the pre-commit hook requirements because you can skip them very well. Um, and yeah, one problem that the security check solves is uh, creating tickets to track failures that need to be fixed. Once it has failed, a, an email will be sent to the owner team and uh, a ticket, in our case a Jira ticket, will be created in their, um, yeah, in their project via Sensu. Uh, which is also smart enough to know to create multiple tickets for consecutive failures and to mark a ticket as done or like solved uh, when transitioning from a red to a green security check. So that's really neat. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is when the security check fails, um, the engineer can um, check the logs. Um, there is a run book. Uh, Run, run, sorry. A run book is like a short link um, just in the output so you don't have to remember anything. It's um, really convenient. And um, yeah, not only you will understand what the problem is and um, why is it a problem, but also what you need to do in order to fix it rather than you a developer delegating this to the security team. So from our point of view, this is awesome. Um, and um, yeah, to recap, we discussed about the shifting to the left uh, approach, uh, why is it is good and what the benefits are. Then we cover security tests that are run every time the service is built as part of the CI-CD pipeline. Well, in our case is Jenkins, but could be the CI-CD of your trace. Um, and uh, very important that by shifting to the left and having in place such tests, um, service developers, service owners are more aware of the security of their service and uh, more involved in keeping uh, them safe. And yeah, I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you deal with false positives? These tests are pretty strong, um, so it's not, they're not flaky. Um, so it's not like one test fail, but we don't actually have that problem. Even with uh, dependency scanning? Because even if you are using a uh, library that has some CVEs, then you still don't necessarily uh, are vulnerable to the problem read the CV. Yeah, right. Um, so for the scan results, we have a look and uh, decide whether, yeah, we, we basically an engineer goes through the, the result and decides whether we should do something or just say, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
So uh, when creating the tickets, how do you know who you should assign this ticket to to work on this? Yeah, that's a very good question. So <laughs> there's a configuration repository for these pipelines. Um, actually, no, scratch that. Um, each repository has a owner's file um, where we know the owner team and some engineers uh, which have worked on that. So since you will check that file and uh, there's another mapping between the team and the Jira project and yeah, it will go this way. Thanks. Oh, I, I cannot hear you. <laughs> Uh, so ticketing is actually automated as well. And yeah, since you does that. Hmm. Cool. Uh, what about? Um, do you have like a timelines, like due dates for each se severity? Like for example, if this blocker should be a couple days or a couple hours to fix it, then if it's like major or minor issue, more time. Is it as well advising the tickets or? Yeah, this is a very good question. So right now, um, even if there are any uh, tests that fail, the pipeline continues, but the email and the tickets, they, they are created. They are, the emails are sent. Um, we are right now working on actually blocking, uh, if one or yeah, if some Im more, more important tests are failing, the pipeline stops and you cannot continue unless you fix that. Uh, but we haven't decided on which one should be the test that actually stopped the pipeline. Okay. But yeah, this is what we, what the plan is. Have you checked all the solutions uh, rather than Claire that can be integrated that might be faster or maybe running that on a nightly basis and then having that information ready for? Yeah, I'm aware that there are other options for container scanning. When we put this in place some time ago, um, Claire was one of the first uh, things that we tried and it worked and uh, it's run by a, a cron job. So yeah, it would be quite easy to switch from weekly to daily. Um, but yeah, since it was in place and it was working fine, um, we didn't evaluate other uh other options, but I, I'm aware that they do exist. So what, what we do is the uh, we got Quai, which is the repository for the containers, and that performs a scan automatically when you push a, a new image to there. And then we use the API to collect the vulnerabilities from Quai. So that means mm -hmm. that we don't need to actually be running the Claire on the on the pipeline, but just consuming the vulnerabilities from from Quai direct from the API. Oh, well, I will I will check it out. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, there aren't any other questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>